Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brad Thompson, and I'm in the executive director of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism. And I'd like to welcome all of you today to our John W. Pope Lecture Series. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank publicly uh, the Pope Foundation for their generous support of this lecture series. And at this time, I'd like all of you to uh, take your cell phones and beepers out and turn them off, please. In fact, I'll do that as well. And now on to the main event. Our speaker today Professor Alan Charles Kors is Professor of European Intellectual History at the University of Pennsylvania, where he has taught for the last 43 years. Imagine being an Ivy League professor as he was at the age of 24. It boggles the mind. Professor Kors received his, PhD, or his BA at Princeton University and his PhD at Harvard. Professor Kors is one of America's leading intellectual historians of modern Europe. He is the author of several important books, including Dolbach's Coterie and Enlightenment in Paris, and Atheism in France, 1650 to 1729, and he was the editor-in-chief of the four-volume Encyclopedia of the Enlightenment, published by Oxford University Press. In addition to, Professor's, to Professor Kors' great intellectual accomplishments, he is also an, a man of extraordinary courage and integrity. He is, I think it true to say, America's leading advocate of free speech and its greatest opponent of political correctness. To that end, he co-authored in 1998 this book, The Shadow University, The Betrayal of Liberty on America's College Campuses one of the most important books ever written defending the marketplace of ideas on America's college campuses. He's also <clears throat> the co-founder of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, America's premier organization defending academic freedom. Professor Kors is also the recipient of many awards, including many teaching prizes, the National Humanities Medal, and the Bradley Prize for his distinguished scholarly work and for his defense of academic freedom. And now a personal note. I first met Alan Kors 16 years ago when we were lecturing together one summer at Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania. And I'll never forget the warm summer night. We sat outside on a picnic bench until the wee hours smoking cigars, sipping adult beverages, and having an intense conversation about the just, the good, and the beautiful. Alan Kors has spent his entire academic career fighting for the need to keep that kind of conversation alive and at the heart of American higher education. If integrity is the principle of being principled, then Alan Kors has it in spades. Today, Professor Kors will speak on socialism's legacy, lest we forget. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure and a great honor for me to introduce Alan Charles Kors. Good adult beverages, I should say. Um, thank you all for coming out in the rain. Uh, I'm glad this is not a football Saturday. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure and a privilege to be here, and I'd like to thank Brad Thompson, Executive Director, and the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism for this invitation. In the wake of the Holocaust and the Nazi ruins, anti-Semitism lay low a bit in the world, shamed by its actual exercise of state dominion. In the wake of the collapse of communism, socialism too lay low for just a moment. Its appeal and route to power, however, are always there in the convergence of liberal free enterprise and political democracy. 
The former creates wealth that has transformed all human possibility, but that gives rise to deep envy. The latter allows ambition a democratic route to seize and redistribute wealth. Indeed, the bounty of free enterprise leads the politicians and the intellectuals to believe that such wealth is a fact of nature, there for the taking, as if it would be produced in equal quantity and quality in any system. Communism is consequential socialism. It seeks the abolition of private property, profit, and voluntary exchange, that is, of the fruits of human invention, thought, risk, talent, and labor. It means central planners who allegedly know what people need and how to satisfy those needs. Socialism is easily understood by any child. It is taking other people's stuff. It is the slaughter of the goose that lays the golden eggs. That folk tale is enduring precisely because it reflects something deep in human nature. It is running other people's lives. To end the appeal of communism in this or that form, one would have to eliminate envy, coercion, and political ambition from our affairs. That would be in another world. The millennial faith of 19th century socialism perhaps no longer moves masses or leaders, but its underlying impulses and values remain potent. Politicians and demagogues still appeal successfully against property, profit, and economic liberty, and quote, the market. After the Berlin Wall fell, indeed today, the U.S. has been drawn toward the central planning of health care, industry, trade, and essential goods and services. After the wall fell, indeed today, Stalin the butcher, according to Russian polls, is the third most popular Russian of all time. To believe that the future will be less susceptible to demagoguery, envy, and the myth of planning would be a foolish act of faith. It is by no means clear to whom the future belongs. In the 1951 preface to the second English edition of his magisterial work on socialism, Ludwig von Mises warned us not to confuse competition among various statists with the deeper ideological conflict of our age, the struggle between supporters of, quote, a market economy and supporters of totalitarian government control. Mises was wrong, historically, to minimize in any way the singular evil of Bolshevism. In the long run, however, he was right that freedom depended ultimately on the outcome of the struggle between private property, voluntary production, and voluntary exchange on the one hand, and central planning on the other. Friedrich Hayek and Mises were at one in believing that central planning had an ultimately totalizing logic. In fundamental economic theory, both understood in contrast to almost all of their intellectual contemporaries that the more complex a society and economy, the more impossible and incoherent the task of central planning became. Without the price mechanism to reflect the choices of individuals, there was no way to discover and allocate economic knowledge or to harmonize the activities of disparate actors toward human satisfaction. More deeply, both understood that central planning placed us 
in Hayek's phrase in the title of his great book, On the Road to Serfdom. In the late 1920s, communists began to distinguish between socialism and communism. Departing from Marx, who appeared to use the terms interchangeably, communists argued that socialism was a transitional stage between capitalism and an unavoidable final communism. In some sense, Hayek's Road to Serfdom, published in 1944, was a sustained argument that indeed even democratic socialism could only be an ineluctable transition toward the almost total abolition of economic, intellectual, and moral liberty. At the heart of his argument lay Hayek's chilling, historically correct and prescient chapter, Why the Worst Get on Top. It was no accident of time or place that the concentration of power over all human life in a centrally planned society attracted and rewarded the aggressive, unscrupulous, and demagogic who would attract around them the simultaneously submissive and ruthless. Central planning would bring forth leaders who took power not as a necessary evil, but as an end in itself. Economic power over the whole life of other persons, Hayek judged, centralized as political power, created a society of slave masters and virtual slaves, in which a leader's decisions about the good of the whole overrode all individualist ethics and law. That means I'm quoting, not that I have yet another odd tick. In such a society, those limited by ethical prohibitions would flee power. And in Hayek's words, quote, those literally capable of everything, close quote, would rise to high positions under a ruler whose primary passion in life was to be obeyed. There were institutional and psychological reasons why socialism with authentic political power must lead to tyranny and cruelty. Hayek's analysis never has been the view of political Europe or of intellectual America. The collapse of the European communist regimes will not entail disillusionment with the substance of socialism under other names unless the latter is linked to the catastrophic experience of the former. There is no reason to believe that this has occurred. For point of reference, the first wave of significant disillusionment that swept across Europe and the West in the 1930s in response to Stalinism was that it had not succeeded in accomplishing the Bolshevik communist dream. By contrast, in the case of Nazism, there were no significant works that spoke of disillusionment because National Socialism had failed to fulfill the ideals of tribalism, exclusive and expansive nationalism, the corporate state, and the Fuhrer principle. The anti-communist texts of greatest appeal to Western intellectuals, however, generally reach the conclusion that Soviet communism had failed to actualize its rightful socialist ideal. Although many of these works touch profoundly on individual being and morality, not one concluded on behalf of classical liberal society. George Orwell's homage to Catalonia in 1938 celebrated as the opposite of communism the ultra-left anarcho-syndicalism that he saw as the most 
anti-liberal strata of the Spanish left. His ineffable 1984 touched on the personal liberty of the private soul, but not on the economic liberty that has been its greatest friend. The final tragedy of Orwell's animal farm was that the leadership of the revolution had become just like the bourgeoisie. Arthur Kessler's searing darkness at noon dreamed of a future in which an absolute ethics would be joined to the socialist struggle against, quote, economic fatality, close quote. The essays of a remarkable book, The God That Failed, published in 1949 and in print ever since, a book subsidized by the CIA for its anti-communism, those essays also concluded, every one of them, with a rejection of an economically liberal society. The editor, Richard Crossman, explained that Marxism, quote, exploded liberal fallacies, which really were fallacies, close quote. The intellectual underpinnings of free enterprise, he wrote, were naive and ahistorical. He concluded that no intelligent man after 1917 could have chosen liberal dogma, and given only two choices, any honest mind would have chosen communism. Only now, post-war, was there an alternative because we could centrally plan the cooperation of free peoples. Arthur Kessler, in his essay, compared his time in the Communist Party to Jacob's finding himself with Leah, not Rachel. Communism had presented itself under false appearances. He hoped that he, like Jacob, would be given the real Rachel. The great Italian Ignazio Salone concluded that socialist values were permanent and on the basis of them, quote, one can found a culture, a civilization, a new way of living together among men. The great African-American author Richard Wright found the communists, quote, blinded by too much oppression, close quote and wrote, quote, I'll be for them even though they are not for me. Andre Gide was disillusioned with Soviet communism because Stalin's Russia was, quote, the same old capitalist society, close quote. Louis Fisher called for a double rejection of competing liberal and communist systems. Stephen Spender concluded that without socialization of the means of production, the world remained, quote, a mass of economic contradictions. He wrote, quote, no criticism of the communists removes the arguments against capitalism. America, the greatest capitalist country, seems to offer no alternative to war, exploitation, and the destruction of the world's resources, close quote. That was the most celebrated anti-communist book of the post-war period, and indeed subsidized by the CIA. Indeed, socialism almost never has been judged as a goal and value by the experience of communism in power. The Marxists themselves, ironically, always ask that forms of human society be judged not by their ideals, but by their living incarnations. If you said to a Marxist, well, we've never really had a Christian society, the Marxist would say, that's philosophical idealism. Look at what happens when you have this or that society. Well, let's do what the Marxists ask us to do and judge it by its living incarnation. The goal of socialism was to reap 
the economic, cultural, scientific, creative, and communal rewards of abolishing private property and free markets, and to end human tyranny. Communism with command of the state sought to create that socialist society. What occurred, in fact, under the inhumane tyranny of those worst who got on top? Lenin, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, Pol Pot, Castro, Mengitsu in Ethiopia, Ceausescu, Hosha, and so on, and so on, and so on. Above all, there are the bodies. One cannot discuss the past, present, or future while they lie there unacknowledged. We are surrounded by slain innocents, and the scale is wholly new. This is not the thousands of the Inquisition. It is not the thousands of American lynching. This is not the six million dead from Nazi extermination. The best scholarship yields numbers that the mind must try to comprehend. Scores and scores and scores and scores of millions of bodies all around us. Martin Malia Berkeley in the Soviet tragedy with only partial views of the archives, posited 20 million dead. Robert Conquest argued in his revision of his extraordinary work, The Great Terror, for a yet higher number. But from inside the Soviet Union, the numbers are extraordinary. Anton Antonov of Sayenko, Soviet historian consulting with historians who had studied the problem of Stalin's dead for Khrushchev, who kept the number secret, claimed that 50 million died at least, without counting the victims of the Civil War or World War II at all. Alexander Yakovlev, Gorbachev's right-hand man who entered the archives for the last Soviet leader, writes in his book, A Hundred Years of, let me get the exact title for you because it's a book that you should read, um, A History of Violence in Soviet Russia, Y-A-K-O-V-L-E-F. Yakovlev, who was Gorbachev's right-hand man, went into the archives and writes that 60 million were slain by deliberate policy in the Soviet Union alone. The brilliant Chinese author, Yong Chang, with her, hus with her historian husband, John Halliday, had access to scores of Mao Zedong's closest friends and collaborators and benefited from the temporary opening of the Russian archives. The Russians had kept the most detailed tabs on Mao from so many sources. In her and her husband's stunning and magisterial book, Mao, The Unknown Story, they reached the figure of 70 million individual lives snuffed out by Mao's deliberate choices. If we count those dead of starvation from the communist's ability to experiment with human interactions in agriculture, 20 million to 40 million in three years in China alone, we may add scores of millions more shot, dead by deliberate exposure, starved, worked to death, murdered in camps meant to extract every last fiber of labor and then kill them, and widows and widowers and orphans. No cause ever 
in the history of all mankind has produced more slaughtered innocents and more orphans than socialism with power. It surpassed exponentially all other systems of production in turning out the dead. They are all around us. No one talks about them, no one honors them, no one does penance for them, no one has committed suicide for having been an apologist for those who did this to them. No one pays for them, no one is hunted down to account for them. It is exactly what Alexander Solzhenitsyn foresaw in the Gulag Archipelago, quote, no, no one would have to answer. No one would be looked into, close quote. The West accepts an epical, monstrous, and unforgivable double standard. We rightly rehearse the crimes of Nazism almost daily. We teach them to our children as ultimate historical and moral lessons, and we bear witness to every victim. We are almost silent on the crimes of communism. So the bodies lie among us, unnoticed, everywhere. We insisted upon denazification, and we excoriated those who tempered it in the name of new or emerging political realities. There never was nor will be a similar decommunization. Though the slaughter of innocents was exponentially greater, though those who signed the orders and ran the camps remain. In the case of Nazism, we hunt down 90-year-old prison guards because the bones cry out for justice, rightly so. In the case of communism, however, we insisted on, quote, no witch hunts, and quote, as the New York Times editorially demanded when Lithuania thought about accountability in 1990. Let the dead bury the dead, but the dead can bury no one. Our artists rightly obsess on the lesser but still immeasurable Holocaust, which lasted several years. And when we watch films such as Night and Fog, Schindler's List, and almost countless other films, we weep and we rededicate the humane parts of our souls. The greater communist Holocaust which lasted decade after decade, the great charnel house of all human history, educes no such art. It's one tender, modest film, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich from Solzhenitsyn's novel, is almost never replayed and cannot be found for purchase. The communist holocaust, however, should have brought forth a flowering of Western art and witness and sympathy. It should have called forth an Atlantic ocean of tears. Instead, it has called forth a glacier of indifference. Kids who in the 1960s had portraits of Mao Zedong or the sadistic Che Guevara on their college walls, the moral equivalent of having hung portraits of Hitler, Goebbels, or Goering in one's dorm now teach our students about the moral superiority of their generation. Every historical textbook lingers on the crimes of Nazism, seeks their root causes, draws a lesson from them, and everyone knows the number six million. By contrast, it is always the errors, the mistakes of communism or of Stalinism, repeated by magical mistake again and again and again. Ask college freshmen how many died under Stalin's regime, and they will answer even now, thousands, tens of thousands? What does that mean? It is the equivalent of believing that Hitler 
killed hundreds of Jews. The scandal of such ignorance derives from an intellectual culture's willful blindness to the catastrophe of its relative sympathies. Chile offered refuge and asylum to Eric Hanukkah, the last tyrant of East Germany who wanted the tanks in the streets. It is time to bury the past without rancor, everyone said. Then it clamored for justice for Chile's Augusto Pinochet. On the very same day, Spain invited, indicted Pinochet for crimes against humanity and welcomed with honors Fidel Castro, while Castro's critics or any group who annoyed the tyrant lay dead or rotted in prison or tried to recover from the deadly work camps to which he sent them. Most of Europe has outlawed the neo-Nazis, but the French Communist Party was from 1999 to 2002 part of a ruling government. One may not fly the swastika, but one may hoist the hammer and sickle at any official event. The denial of Hitler's dead or the minimization of the Jewish Holocaust is literally a crime in most of Europe. The denial or minimization of communist crimes is an intellectual and political art form. The Khmer Rouge in Cambodia enslaved a nation and slaughtered a fifth to a fourth of the entire Cambodian population, as if an American regime had murdered some 56 million to 70 million of its people. The absurd consensus today among intellectuals, however, about Pol Pot, who learned his politics in Paris from French communists and Western intellectuals and was the darling of the communist Chinese, is that he was a creation not of his beliefs, but of American bombing on behalf of anti-communism in Indochina. The bones of Cambodia and the millions who risked death to flee communist Vietnam and Laos for an uncertain life anywhere else tells us about the value, though not necessarily the tactical wisdom, of the anti-communist cause there, too. Anti-fascist is a term of honor. Anti-communist is a term of ridicule and abuse. So the dead lie among us ignored, and anyone with moral eyes must see them, spilling naked out of our media, frozen in pain in our classrooms, and sprawled unburied across our politics and our culture. Socialism, wherever it actually had the means to plan a society, to abolish private property, and to assail economic inequality and the allocation of capital and goods by free markets, culminated in the crushing of individual, economic, religious, associational, and political liberty. Its, collective of ag its collectivization of agriculture alone led to untold suffering, scarcity, and injustice. It was at its best the ability through fear and slave labor to build Gary, Indiana once without the good stuff and without the ability even to maintain it. Socialism in power produced scarcity, murderous inefficiency, arbitrary inequality, cronyism, enslavement, concentration camps, torture, terror, the destruction of civil society, ecological disaster, brutal secret police, and systemic tyranny. 
Everywhere it ruled, there were beyond our ability to comprehend their courage. Those who endured solitary confinement, sleep deprivation, the sadistic infliction of pain, and slow or rapid death because they said no, or because they criticized, or because they would not denounce their friends and colleagues, or simply because they annoyed for whatever reason, even a joke, a communist with power. To be moral beings, we must acknowledge and bear witness to those things. Until socialism is confronted with its lived communist reality, the greatest atrocities of all recorded human life, we live in its age. It will not happen. The pathology of Western intellectuals has committed them to an adversarial relationship to the very culture that has produced both the greatest liberation from want, ignorance, and superstition, and the greatest increase of bounty and opportunity in human history. No one has explained the origin and development of that intellectual pathology adequately, though it constitutes one of the deepest flaws and tragedies of our society. It is a pathology that with each passing decade becomes ever coarser, more crude, and more detached from any principle of reality. That pathology allows Western intellectuals to step around the Everest of bodies of the victims of communism without a tear, an act of contrition, or a reevaluation of self, soul, and mind. For them, the victims of communism are mere abstractions. We are educated, entertained, instructed, and informed by individuals who do not see this unspeakable mass of bodies, but who see at best only words about them. Faced with the accomplishments of their own society, however, Western intellectuals have the sensitivities of the princess and the pea. In the midst of unparalleled social mobility, they cry caste system. In a society of unparalleled bounty, they cry either poverty or consumerism, depending on which phase of the business cycle we are in. In a culture of ever more varied, self-defined, and satisfying lives, they cry alienation. In a society that has liberated women, racial minorities, religious minorities, and sexual minorities to an extent that no one could have dreamed possible just 50 years ago, they cry oppression. In a civilization of boundless private charity, they cry avarice in an economy in which hundreds of millions have benefited from the risk, knowledge, and capital of others. They cry exploitation in a society that broke on behalf of merit the seemingly eternal chains of station by birth. They cry injustice. This intellectual behavior is a pathology that freezes time selectively to suit its purposes. The first economic dislocations of industrialization became the intellectual's permanent model for the capitalist future that emerged from such dynamism. As, <clears throat> as if one somehow should ignore the process that raised previously unimaginable numbers of human beings to a dignified, free life, protected as never before from helplessness before nature and men. Russia from 1914 to 1917 became frozen for all time 
with war and Rasputin the only alternative to Stalinism, as if the rising curve of Russian economic and social development by the early 20th century had not occurred. This pathology also allows intellectuals and other dreamers to restake their claims with no accountability for the past. Lenin, then Stalin, then Mao, then Kim Il-sung, then Fidel, then Ho Chi Minh, then the Khmer Rouge, truly ad nauseum. The intellectual manifestation of that pathology was and is a collective delusion that ignores both history and ethology, the study of the life of species. It is a belief that kindness, stable order, justice, peace, freedom, legal equality, and mutual forbearance are the default state of things in human affairs and that malice, disorder, violence, coercion, slavery, legal inequality, aversion to difference, intolerance, and cruelty are the aberrations that stand in need of historical explanation. Getting the defaults precisely and systematically wrong, Western intellectuals fail to understand and appreciate the form of society that has given us the ability to alter those defaults. They believe both that the most productive human cultures are almost wholly dysfunctional and that evolved successful societies may be redrawn at will by intellectuals with political and cultural power. They write as if relative pockets of Western poverty should occasion our astonishment when, in fact, the term until recently for almost infinitely worse levels of poverty was quite simple. It was called human life. The Marxists, as noted, had one argument right we should judge human systems in their actual history and practice. In extraordinary bad faith, however, they applied that measure to everything except what allegedly mattered the most to them. From one end of the earth to the other, Marxist intellectuals, propagandists, professors, and apologists never contrasted the existing socialist world with the more or less liberal societies of Western Europe and North America. They contrasted instead a fictional perfect society that never was to an imperfect society that had accomplished actual wonders. Marxists were fond of denouncing such anti-realism as philosophical idealism when they condemned it in others. In fact, they were the most anti-realist of all. Those few who rigorously appraise the socialist phenomenon should be among the most celebrated intellectuals in our midst and memory. In fact, they remain the most marginalized. The chasm between what central planning and liberal society brought us should be the most studied phenomenon of our times. One looks in vain for such study in our research, textbooks, schools, and universities. Economists who might explain such things rarely trouble themselves to do economic history. Historians who do the so-called economic and social history of capitalism still teach the world's greatest liberation and enhancement of life as the history of repression, regimentation, degradation, and waste. The humanities in general have become schools of oppression studies in the very societies that have liberated humankind from want, tyranny, and coercion. 
For almost 50 years, America sacrificed its wealth and at times the lives of its young to contain armed communism. Its brave pilots risked their lives and training by skimming the hills of Western Europe to the great anger and annoyance of the German picnickers whose liberty depended upon such sacrifice. Its submariners left behind comfort, family, and friends to make full deterrence real. The West did whatever it had to do to prevent the armed Bolsheviks from achieving tactical or strategic superiority. America sustained its will and its great burden of debt even when its artists, college students, professors, authors, and filmmakers turned against the alleged folly of such efforts. It accepted the moral responsibility of its own and its enemies' bombs, missiles, and nuclear strategies. This was the burden it chose to bear. And then, in a seeming miracle, the fatal weakness of tyranny, central planning, and illiberalism combined with American will were actualized in the collapse of European communism. Would the West now assess what it had fought to preserve and what it had fought to prevent? There was and is no rush to do the assessment and comparison that ought to have been this most urgent and welcome intellectual and moral task. What might an optimist have expected? An anti-communist epiphany, a festival of celebration, a flowering of comparative scholarship, a full accounting of the communist reality, political, economic, moral, ecological, social, and cultural, a set of profound, anguished, and soul-searching mea culpas. I am guilty from all of those who without malice had been tragically wrong. A revision of curriculum, a recognition of the precious value of a truly limited government. These are reasonable expectations, but the data are profoundly and grimly discouraging. Those who teach, comment upon, or write about such things still ignore Mises and Hayek and the dissidents and those few historians who told them the truth all along. They do not draw or even see the lines from Marx to Lenin to Stalin to Mao to Che or Fidel or Chavez. Where were the outpourings of joy? Leonard Bernstein played Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in Berlin before the destroyed wall and substituted Freiheit, freedom, for Freude, joy. But where else and why not? I'll give you a mental game. Imagine if World War II had ended with a European Nazi empire from the Urals to the English Channel, soon armed with nuclear weapons in mortal contest with the United States in a peace kept only by deterrence. Imagine an evolution from a Hitler to a Nazi technocrat like Albert Speer. Would progressive children during that Cold War have sung, all we are saying is give peace a chance beneath symbols of unilateral disarmament? Would our intellectuals have mocked the phrase evil empire? What were the differences, however, deaths Camps, the desolation of the flesh and spirit, the bodies will not be buried without an answer to that. How mute we were in 1989 at the fall of the hammer and sickle, slaughter of the symbol of the ultimate slaughter. If it had been the Third Reich swastika that had fallen after two generations of Cold War, the joy and catharsis would have lit our cities.
does our culture believe or disbelieve what Solzhenitsyn stated so directly about the Soviets, quote, that no other regime on earth could compare with it either in the number of those it had done to death, in hardiness, in the range of its ambitions, in its thoroughgoing and unmitigated totalitarianism, no, not even the regime of its pupil, Hitler, close quote. From the economists to the cultural scholars to the ecologists, history now has opened a vast terrain to study the difference in real terms between private property and commons or communal or state ownership, between markets and planning, between individual rights or collective purpose. Are historians teaching their students any differently about the human consequences of free markets in a real world of comparative phenomena? Have our scholars in cultural or sexual studies re-examined their premises in the light of the study of the marginalized sexual groups behind the Iron Curtain, brutalized? or indeed so close by in Cuba where gays under Castro were sent to work camps and often to their deaths. Indeed, how extraordinary that we do not have an intellectual, moral, and above all historical accounting of who was wrong and who was right and why in their analyses of socialism and socialism in power. We live in an era of appalling bad faith. Where is even the effort toward an essential empirical and moral ledger? The Black Book of Communism, by brilliant worldwide scholars, and you should read it, had minor influence in France, which still returned the Communist Party to the power of ministries and government. Where else? It has never penetrated American life or even college bookstores, although it answered the questions that should have most been on everyone's mind. What will we teach the children, the students? What was at stake? Was deterrence worth it? Who knew what and when? Our children do not know what happened in any domain under socialism in power. Those who depend on our media and films do not know. The strength of even relatively free enterprise and even relatively limited government will ensure that our civilization lives on prosperous and strong by any historical standard. It does so without self-belief, however, and without moral understanding of its place in the drama of human life, and without accounting for the scores of millions of dead and for the societies and beliefs that butchered them. You put private property ahead of people. You put profits ahead of people. These remain potent maledictions as if <clears throat> private property were not absolutely essential to the well-being, dignity, liberty, and lives <clears throat> of the people. You put profits ahead of people as if profits were not the measure of other people's satisfactions of want and desire. Indeed, it is precisely to avoid the revitalization of classical liberal principles that our teachers, professors, information media, and filmmakers ignore the comparative inquiry <clears throat> that the time so urgently demands. It is precisely because of the lessons that would be taught by knowledge that no revision of the curriculum occurs. For at least a generation, intellectual contempt for liberal society has been at the core 
of the humanities and the soft social sciences. This has accelerated, not changed, since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And our children do not know about the bodies. They do not know. When we examine ongoing communist regimes, however transformed, how can we not be informed by history and the bodies? Again, a monstrous historical double standard. When the right-wing Jörg Haider achieved democratic political success in Austria about a decade ago, the governments of Western Europe made him a pariah for his symbolic and rhetorical ties to the Hitler of two generations ago. Fine, and the ruling communist heirs of Stalin and Mao stand in Tiananmen Square, in the center of Beijing, and the highest, most enormous portrait is of the butcher of 70 million, Mao Zedong, and he is on every one of the currencies circulating in their newly partially freed economy. In terms of death and suffering, the Lao Gai, the labor camps of China, should be more infamous than the concentration camps of Germany and German conquest in terms of deaths and suffering. And indeed, they are yet more extraordinary because they are with us still, by the most serious estimates, perhaps 50 million individuals have passed through them. In North Korea, with its nuclear arms, a nation starves because of the madness and self-indulgence of its megalomaniacal tyrant planners. Realism and new contexts may well counsel normalization of relations with some or all of these murderous regimes, but with eyes open, but with fraternity toward the victims, but with moral lines we will not cross. As for the mea culpas, we await them in vain. When Eisenhower heard that the German residents of a nearby city didn't know about a death camp whose stench should have reached their nostrils. He marched them well-dressed through the rotting corpses, and he made them dispose of the dead. <clears throat> the mayor of Goethe and his wife went home from this and hanged themselves. We lack Eisenhower's authority. The great Czech novelist Milan Kundera stated the moral reality with clarity. What about those with good intentions, he asked in the unbearable lightness of being, who didn't know and acted in good faith? Kundera referred us to Oedipus, quote, when Oedipus realized that he himself was the cause of their suffering, he put out his own eyes and wandered blind away from Thebes, unable to stand the sight of the misfortunes he had wrought by not knowing. He put out his eyes and wandered blind away from Thebes. Let the apologists for communism Acknowledge the dead, bury the dead, and atone for the dead. Otherwise, let them be forgiven when they have put out their eyes and wandered blind away from Thebes. Let Western intellectuals learn the words of Requiem, the great poem written during the Stalinist terror by Anna Akhmatova, the greatest Russian poet of the 20th century, quote, I will remember them always and everywhere. I will never forget them, no matter what comes, close quote. The bodies demand accounting, apology, and repentance. Without such things, the age of communism lives. Thank you very much.
That was uh, a remarkable uh, talk, and I hope uh, the students here will remember this talk uh, for a very long time. Uh, I promise you, you, you will not hear uh, a talk uh, as important uh, and as uh, inspiring uh, as the one that you just heard. We now have a few minutes. Uh, we have 25 minutes, actually, uh, for questions and answers. That's his polite way of saying I went five minutes over. <laughs> Uh, we have microphones uh, on each side of the aisle. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please come on down to the microphone. Uh, let me ask two things of you. First, uh, we'll take the first two questions as we always do from students. Uh, and just please remember this is a uh, question and answer, and the most important part is the answer. So uh, no speeches, uh, please uh, uh, ask a brief question. and. Uh, uh, we'll have time for uh, the answer. I've either bored you or left you in stunned silence. Um, here we go. Thank you. Uh, in, in the last 20 years, as China's developed economically and opened its markets, um, a lot of people have talked about how it will, or just assumed how it will naturally bring a democratization. And now with the revolu with revolutions going on in a uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, there have been calls from activists, Chinese activists, both abroad and in China, for uh, protests of their own. And uh, the, the response by the Chinese government has been to roll back foreign reporter rights, um, mm -hmm. uh, clamp down on the internet. And I read an article this morning about how they deployed uh, 740,000 uh, security personnel in Beijing at these sites. Yes. So early in your speech, you said that socialism was a stepping stone to communism, like inevitably. Do you think that uh, the open market reforms in China could be a stepping stone to democracy, or do you think that they'll clamp back down? Uh, you, you've asked such a deep and important uh, question. Well, if you say something like that, no one cares. He won't care what my answer is. But you have. You've asked such a deep and important question. The debate you will often hear. Um, among people who call themselves classical liberals, defenders of a free market society and democratic society. Um, the argument, and it's a very intense argument, is will economic liberalization bring about democratic liberalization? Um, and on the other side, can you even have a liberal economy without the free flow of information, of criticism, um, of the end to um, party cronyism. Um, given where they started from, catastrophe, absolute economic catastrophe, um, any economic liberalization in China would have brought about a very dramatic rise um, in production, national product, um, standards of living, though it's extraordinarily unequal by, by region. Um, here's my own take on the, the heart of the deep question that you answer. Um, one, I think that China will be an economic mirage, contrary to everything that you hear. Um, one essential um, commodity in a free economy is information um, and criticism. Those don't exist in China. Freedom of the flow of information, freedom of criticism. Um, so I think they will continue to ride this extraordinary curve given their allowing of incentives. Um, and a second strategy that they've pursued which is the moment anyone becomes successful, um, he or she gets invited into the Communist Party of China. Um, and the children have access to special schools, and they have access to special privileges. So they're co-opting the successful. They've allowed for, for liberalization. But you saw it in Tiananmen Square. They are willing to kill their best and brightest to stay in power.
the Communist Party of China does not hold power because it thinks, how do we manage this economic liberalization and move away from Maoist communism without too much disorder? Um, they hold power because it is power that they seek and want and do anything to maintain. What they have done in Tibet, the destruction of a people, a culture, is as close to cultural genocide, a term you hear all the time um, in other contexts, um, as has ever been committed. And note well um, that in this stretch where our president is named the new ambassador to China with glowing remarks about American-Chinese cooperation, that our president, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, said virtually nothing when this year's winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, a Chinese dissident who is wasting away in slave labor camps, um, said almost nothing. Uh, this is a tyranny. It is a tyranny that will ride a wave of economic growth, um, given where its baseline was, and it will look very, very good. But there will be a moment where the issue is, do you share power? Do you allow criticism? Do you allow people to choose those who will govern them? And I guarantee you the Chinese answer will be no. Um, you prevent that, and you kill as many people as you need to to prevent that. Um, Red China will make Libya look like a picnic um, if that government feels threatened. The only caveat I should give you is students once asked me if being an historian I could predict the future. Um, and I said, no, I can't, but I can tell you what won't happen. And someone said, what won't happen? What do you know won't happen? And I gave two answers. I said, Russia will never allow the reunification of Germany, and whites in South Africa will never give up their tyranny without a bloodbath. Um, so let's not take me as a prophet. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts? Um, yes. You want to come down to the mic so people can hear you? Should businessmen have the same responsibility of intellectuals in recognizing that they are, uh, uh, in effect, supporting these tyrannies by um, building factories in China as they once clamored for business in the Soviet Union? For me, the answer to that is yes. For most people who agree with me about things political, the answer is no. Um, they believe that the more you introduce markets and goods um, into communist societies, um, the more you hasten their political liberalization. Um, Europe buys almost all of its paper flowers from the slave labor camps of the Chinese Lao Gai, the Chinese concentration camps. Um, that's extraordinary. And I think that the business community uh, does have real moral responsibilities in its relationship with tyranny. Substitute Hitler for China, right? Substitute Nazi Germany for any communist country and think of how differently that equation will read to certain people. Um, but that's a deep question. There is a celebrated essay um, by Milton Friedman, a great defender of liberty in my view, um, who said that the corporation does not have something called social responsibility. It has legal responsibility, um, and its moral and legal responsibility are to increase the profits of shareholders. Um, 
I have a great deal of difficulty um, with businesses that, whose investments um, support and make things better for tyrannical regimes. Um, and that, not just in the communist world. Uh, I would encourage others to come down uh, and ask more questions. And uh, in the interim, I will ask a question. Uh, is it your argument that socialism must lead in, in, in inevitably to communism? I, I think that um, Hayek's argument, and if you read one book out of this lecture, um, read Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, um, H-A-Y-E-K, published in 1944. Um, I'm going to get back to your question. Um, everyone, I mean everyone, educated and moral, should read the three volumes of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's um, The Gulag Archipelago, if you want to understand the 20th century. That's a, that's a read, that's a moral obligation, in my view. Um, you ought to read Alexander Yakovlev on violence in Soviet Russia, um, and you ought to read Jung Chang, C-H-A-N-G, her first name is J-U-N-G, Jung Chang, um, on Mao, the uh, unknown story. Uh, I think that Hayek was correct that the logic, the institutional and psychological logic um, of a planned economy is ultimately totalizing and therefore totalitarian and therefore it will be fled by those with ethical scruples um, and staffed by those without them. And let me, let me answer in two ways. Um, no one tells you what to buy. You, you make those choices yourselves. And people who are interested in making profits have to respond to those choices. If you don't like one seller, you go to another. If you don't like one landlord, you move. If you don't like one government, you vote for a different party. Um, when you have a planned economy and when you abolish private property, um, someone must make the decision. Plan in what ways, what the people need. They now must make those purchase decisions for you. What should you really buy and what shouldn't you buy? Removing choice in the interest of a collective pursuit, those central planners who are at one and the same time your school teacher, your landlord, your employer, and your police. That's an extraordinary concentration of power, ladies and gentlemen. That is an extraordinary concentration of power. They must get people to be part of what we are planning for. And you see this in the history of every communist society, which means in the final analysis, they must govern the culture. They must control values. It's why religion um, or any independent thinking is such an enemy. They must control the values, the preferences, the culture, and the education. Um, and they must find ways to repress um, those who are urging different paths. And elections don't take care of that. Because if you're planning an entire economy, if you're planning the allocation of all goods and services and human choices, you can't every four years turn around and say, oh, let's abandon A and do B. Um, elections don't get you out of that dilemma. Uh, so I think Hayek had it right. Um, the interesting thing are the post-East European fall lessons learned or not learned um, 
by other communist regimes. And it's why the question on China was so profound. We will learn a lot from what happens in China. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about the countries of Northern Europe, which are democratic and socialist at the same time. The um, mixed economies. They, yeah. they don't seem to have any tendency toward becoming totalitarian, but they call themselves socialist, and mm -hmm. they have a large government, high taxes, lots of social services. Much of the economy is run in one way or the other by the state. How does that fit into your mm -hmm. dichotomy? I think that that is uh, simultaneously the, the uh, sharpest and the most acute objection um, to the, to the uh, thesis that I have been arguing here. Uh, uh, that if you look to the Scandinavian countries, Sweden in particular, um, don't we have their central planning um, that has not tended in any way um, toward totalitarianism? Um, and it seems to me that there are uh, two answers to that. One, um, that uh, against a large part of the thesis I've argued, um, that the Scandinavian countries have chosen to hold on to mixed economies, inequalities of wealth. To me, above all, private property. Um, and whether you have real socialism without the abolition of private property, which was always the call um, of 19th century European socialists, um, is an open and interesting question. The second, and we're going to learn a lot over the next decades, or at least you'll learn a lot over the next decades from this, uh, is Sweden, Denmark, Norway um, are, until very recently, homogenous, ethnically undiversified populations. Um, there are a lot of things you can do in a village or a tribe that you can't do in a complex and diversified nation. There's a Swedish understanding about limits. It's cultural. In many ways, it's tribal. Um, and there's a shared identity. What is interesting now is with the large flow of immigration um, into Sweden, um, Malmo is, is half non-Swedish now. Um, with the large influx of immigration and non-European immigration, um, and in, in Scandinavia in particular, a large amount of, of immigration from North Africa and from the Middle East, what will happen to that system um, in the presence of ethnic diversity, of a less a more heterogeneous, a less homogeneous um, society. Um, there's an understanding in Sweden. You don't exploit the system. <laughs> you, you, you take certain social benefits, but then you have to give um, certain things in, in private labor. Um, if, in fact, uh, Sweden ends up with a large dependent population that is not part of that cultural consensus, um, the very challenging question you put may, may get an answer um, over time. Will they have to, uh, to avoid certain political and economic phenomena? Um, will they have to pull back from um, the partially planned, partially free market economies they have? Um, or uh, will it produce a drift um, toward an ever more powerful state and ever less powerful private individuals. But, but your question um, is one that everyone arguing my thesis, I think, um, should be called upon to address. Uh, the heart of my answer would be that they're like cities, um, that an homogenous ethnic group um, with an homogenous culture is a very different society from a complex society that must coordinate the desires, aspirations, allocation of resources to very disparate individuals. Uh, but you're quite right that they have not been on the road to serfdom. Um, and uh, 
I hope your question stays in my listener's mind also. Thank you. Uh, in your speech, you talked about how the United States took a very uh, active role during the Cold War to contain communism, both in uh, Europe and in Asia, and even got uh, directly involved in Vietnam and mm -hmm. Korea. Um, in more modern times, you know, uh, we went into Afghanistan and Iraq, and, um, and in one, we were more successful than the other in establishing democracy. Um, after seeing what we've seen very recently in North Africa, um, you know, with Egypt and now with Libya, and, we, and now we see, these, uh, we see these revolutions coming about from the people. What would you say is the United States' role going forward in um, establishing uh, liberal societies uh, around the world? Um, uh, one, I don't think that you can impose liberal societies from, from, from the outside. Um, it seems to me that you restrain from the support of evil tyranny and wickedness. Um, and as we did with the labor unions in Poland, solidarity, um, so central to the downfall of communism, you give active aid and support um, to those people bearing witness to certain um, values of, of individual rights and, and individual freedom. That, that seems to me um, crucial. Um, I also think that one needs to distinguish absolutely essentially um, between um, nation building, as, as you're, you're describing it, um, and seeing to American security. There are real thoughtful debates to be had about the requirements of American security. Those are true during the Cold War. That is true now. Um, I think that the myth that the U.S. can bring democracy, though if I were to play the role of, of the gentleman who asked me about Sweden, I would say, well, what happened in Japan after World War II? Didn't we do it there? Uh, what happened in West Germany after Hitler? Uh, so again, take, take my answer with a grain of salt. I think it's almost impossible to impose um, a free and liberal society uh, from uh, from the outside. But I would draw another lesson from what's happening in the Middle East, um, which is, uh, and it's also true of Tiananmen, the Tiananmen Square massacres in China, um, a nation that is not willing to slaughter its own citizens, a government, a regime that is not willing to slaughter large numbers of its own citizens to stay in tyrannical power will lose power. Um, a regime that is willing to deploy planes, tanks, um, whatever is necessary, um, as Saddam Hussein did to the Kurds and Shiites after the first Gulf War, as the Chinese did in Tiananmen Square, as Gaddafi may or may not achieve, um, a nation willing to slaughter large numbers of its own. The crucial moment of the end of the Cold War, for me, um, was the meeting between Gorbachev and Honecker, the tyrant of uh, East Germany. And uh, Honecker said to him, um, and I'm sure Gorbachev is accurately conveying it, Honecker said to him, um, if you don't send the tanks, if you don't let us send out the tanks, um, it will be the fall of communism. And Gorbachev said, I won't send out the tanks. You may not send out the tanks. Um, and uh, I believe in China, they will send out the tanks. Uh, going back to your socialism leading to communism point, I, People could say right now with the United States, a lot of things are slowly becoming socialistic. There are different reforms that people are saying socialistic, et cetera. And personally, I'm becoming a little nervous as to where we're headed mm -hmm. as far as our government and the amount of involvement that it mm -hmm. has in our citizens' private lives. Mm -hmm. And I want to get your take on where you see our nation going. And I, said, I know you said you don't like predict the future, but what do you see us you know, heading towards? Are we right. going to... 
eventually squelch all of the government's interventions, or is it just going to yeah. keep growing? I mean, I think the, the logic of governmental power um, is to exercise it um, such that Republicans can talk a terrific free market um, language until they actually have power, um, whereupon it's program after program and crony after crony. Um, I mean, the extraordinary bailout occurred under, under the Bush administration. Uh, and uh, I think that raises extraordinary dangers of the fact that uh, as power accumulates, it never gives anything back. It's always expanding, right? Your taxes pay for an American board of tea tasters, right? The need for tea tasters probably didn't exist in the beginning. It certainly doesn't exist now. Um, but uh, government programs, once established, never end. They just never end. So the logic is ever more decision made by government and ever fewer decisions um, made by individuals. Um, democracy is an extraordinary thing, but Hitler could have been elected democratically. Um, and democracy is not the same as liberty. Um, it is not the same as um, individual rights. The simplest way to think of that, and it, it bears, I hope, on your, on your question, is there are, in the final analysis, two kinds of decisions. Um, one, decisions you make for yourself, and two, decisions other people make for you, whether it's one tyrant or 51% of your fellow citizens. So, um, well, here, there's someone who whose name I should know because he asked the first question. Your name is Andrew. Andrew. Okay. So if we said to Andrew, um, uh, Andrew, we've decided that you should marry Louise. That would work out best. And you say, what do you mean you've decided that I should marry Lu That's the kind of decision I get to make for myself. If I say to you, but Andrew, we took a vote. 52% think that you should marry Louise. You would rightly say, I don't care if 99.99%, that's a decision I get to make for myself. Right? Do I go to church or not? Which church do I go to? You don't care if those decisions are made democratically if you don't get to make them for yourself. You have lost your liberty whether the tyrant is a democratic majority um, or whether the tyrant is a megalomaniacal individual. Well, we have an ever-growing number of decisions that other people make for you that you don't get to make for yourself. Um, and the long-term trend of that is the ever-greater um, role of government in deciding everyone's life and the correspondingly lesser role of free private individuals to define and choose and risk things um, so that their life is their own. The critical thing, I mean, what I would keep my eye on is private property. Um, if the state can take away property that you own, that you've lived on, um, and give it to a developer because that's good for economic development, not to mention the developer gives lots of money to the local politicians. If private property goes, then in my view there is no safeguard whatsoever. Um, and I would always keep my eye on the relationship of government to private property. Thank you for such a good question. Well, uh, Alan, on uh, behalf of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism, uh, I'd like to thank you for, uh, for an extraordinary talk, and I'd like all of you to uh, join me in thanking Professor Kors. Thank you. Thank you.